Next Sunday morning, November 1st at Mountain Movers Church, J.D. Anderson, the Iceman, actually from Knoll, Missouri. Originally not, from Originally Knoll. from Knoll, Missouri. Not now. He lives far away because he travels like all over the world. Crazy, awesome guy. All that awesome stuff that you saw is great. But the best part is he loves God. And he has a testimony. He has a story of what God has done in his life. And he's going to be here next Sunday morning to share with us what God has done in his life. And so he's going to be here both services. So make sure that you bring as many friends as you possibly can. As you can see, there are many available seats next to you that we can take advantage of. And just fill these seats up, both services. Let's pack the place out because just imagine, just, just think with me for just a second. Yeah, it's, it's really exciting what he can do. It's exciting, and I'm looking forward to hearing his story. But just imagine if you were to invite somebody that does not know God, and this is exciting enough that, hey, they just want to come see it, and they come to Christ next Sunday because you got them to come. That's what this is all about. So bring two, three, four, five friends if you need to rent a van or a U-Haul and get a bus, get your CDL. A U-Haul? You're going to put people yeah, in Yeah, put a people in a U-Haul and, and, and drive them here and fill these seats up because it takes. You, you are only limited, all right? How many people you can bring to Christ next week, you're only limited by how many you can get here, right? right. So if you need to get your CDL next week, get a bus. Fill it up. Get a 75 passenger and bring them here and let's fill it up. It's going to be awesome. That's right. It is going to be awesome. If you guys that are in the, your students and you're in the schools, take a bunch of these cards with you because you may see J.D. Anderson in your school because this week, starting tomorrow and through this week, he's going to be in all the local schools. Not all of them, but many local schools he'll be at. And you can tell your friends, he's coming to my church to tell us about Jesus this Sunday. So it's an awesome opportunity. Well, today we are in the last week. Everybody say, aw. Part five. Part five of our mystery series. I have personally had a lot of fun doing this series. We've never done it in eight years. We've allowed you to submit questions to us that we are preaching. And I will tell you, there have been many questions that we just couldn't get to. It could probably go on and on and on. But what we've done is we're going to save those questions back. So if you submitted a question and you're like, oh, they didn't cover it. We're saving those, and you'll hear it come around at some point. Maybe we'll do an entire series on one of your questions. But today, we are going to be in our final week, part five. And I have a question for you. I want you to finish this sentence, okay? I don't want to go to church because the church is full of a bunch of hypocrites. You knew it. You got it. The church is full of a bunch of hypocrites. So today in part five, the question is this, why go to church if the church is full of hypocrites? Amen. Before we do, I want to just ask God to bless this message and guide our words this morning and take us deep into his word so that we leave changed and transformed. How many of you guys are ready for an awesome message, ready for life change? Amen? Yes. 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 All right, let's bow our heads and let's go to the Lord this morning. Father, we are totally and completely dependent upon you. We believe in your word, that it is life-changing, that it is powerful. And we lean on your word this morning. We lean not on our own understanding, but we trust in you and ask you, God, to guide us through your word, guide us through this message to help to encourage us to leave this place different than the way we came. We believe it and we expect it. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. Amen and amen. Okay, so this really is a common thing that we hear a lot, right? As we're hanging out and talking to friends, just casually talking about church, we hear a lot of people say, man, I'm not, I'm not going to church. I'm not cut out for church. It's just full of a bunch of hypocrites. Why do we find ourselves or hear other people saying this so commonly? Well, let's, let's just get really real, okay? Because a lot of times people who have not been in church, they see people who they might appear as if they're living two lives. You know, you might see them on Facebook, you know, after church on Sunday morning using a church language like, oh, praise the Lord. God is so good. Amen. Hallelujah. Right? They use all these church terms, right? Hold on. Do the it. church term hallelujah. This week, there's going to be a hallelujah party at the Grove Civic Center actually this Saturday night and we need volunteers to go and help us. That was a good segue. There. It was. That was wow. We need volunteers to go wow. and help us. That was awesome. Carnival booths 
for this huge outreach. This is an outreach where all the churches come together and we put on a, an event for the entire community so that our kids can be safe and off the streets. But what I was gonna say is a lot of times we use these terms in church and we don't even know what they mean. Right. So this morning I'm gonna right. throw a freebie in. What does hallelujah actually mean? Hold on, I wanna take a poll. Random poll, raise your hand, don't lie. If you really, if you really know, know what the word hallelujah means, raise your hand. Sweet. How many have ever said the word hallelujah? How many of you guys have ever said it? All right. <laughs> so let me tell Brandy's like. Bunch of church people. <laughs> you don't even know what you're saying. All right. So okay. hallelujah means praise Jehovah. Or Yahweh. Or Yahweh, which that, that Yahweh. word Yahweh is God. So praise Jehovah. God or praise Jehovah is what hallelujah means. That hallowed, was free. Hallowed it didn't cost you anything. Comes from or hallowed or holy comes from halle, hallelujah. Luya, the J is silent, comes from Jehovah. Praise Jehovah. Really cool. We say it all the time. We don't have a clue what it means. It's awesome. <laughs> so so that's a really good example of a lot of times we see people using this church language, right. but doggone it, saw them in the bar on Friday night right? Maybe saw them just totally plaster, or maybe on the same Facebook page, they're just rip-roaring all the best of the best cuss words, and just, yeah, they're, they're living it. And, and I'm not being critical. I'm just telling you why people say that. That's just why people have the, they're like, you know what? Let's really dig a little bit deeper. So, so why does it bother people so bad that there are people in the church that seem like they're maybe living two lives? Because they think that they're fake, right? They think they're fake. And, and most of us would agree that we don't want to be a part of anything that is fake. We want to be a part of something that is real. So if we dig deep, really what people are saying is, I want to be a part of something that is real. And I want to be around people who are real. And Mountain Movers Church, I have good news for you this morning. We are about as real as you can get. And this message is going to blow your mind. All right. So if you have your word, go to Matthew chapter 7, we're going to look at where Jesus used this word hypocrite. It's not just a word that we see today. It's a word we see in the Word of God. And we're going to help you to break it down. Jesus used this word many times, like 18 to 20 times in the New Testament. Jesus said, you bunch of hypocrites. hypocrites. But we're going to help you to understand who he's talking to. Matthew chapter 7, verses 3 through 5. And it, 3 through 5. 3 through 5. 3 through 5. 3 through 5. And it says this. And why worry about a speck in your friend's eye when you have a log in your own? How can you think of saying to your friend, let me help you get rid of that speck in your eye when you can't see past the log in your own eye? Hypocrite! First get rid of the log in your own eye, then you will be able to see well enough to deal with the speck in your friend's eye. Jesus was talking to a group of people that were leaders in that day and time. He was talking to the religious leaders, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Say that really fast 10 times. No. He was talking to a group of people who at that time, he also said were like whitewashed tombs. Have you ever been to a graveyard before? You bunch of liars. Come on. This is interactive. All right. You've been to a graveyard. You've seen a graveyard. Okay. Brad and I got the privilege of go, going to Israel in 2011. And as we stood in Jerusalem and we were standing on one hillside and we looked across, we saw the tombs that Jesus was talking about when he said those very words. He looked at the religious people and he said, you whitewashed tombs. You're like those whitewashed tombs over there. And we stood there and we were like, oh, that's exactly like Jesus was standing here. Where I'm standing, and, we were on, we and he were was on looking the temple over steps. there. We were on the temple steps. We were on the steps the of the temple where he was teaching, and here's what he was saying. He was saying, on the outside, you look all pretty and white and pure, but on the inside, you are dead. Because why do we go to a graveyard? but to see our loved ones who have already passed away. He was looking at those tombs and he was saying, you are whitewashed on the outside and on the inside you are dead. What he was talking about to these Pharisees and these Sadducees is that they were acting one way in church or in the temple and acting a complete different way at home and around their friends. And so I want to take you and I want to show you. Uh, let me go somewhere with that. Okay, hit it. Okay, so these, these Pharisees were really well known for getting out in public and they would 
boast and brag about how much they fasted and how much money they gave to the temple. And they were all about bragging about how big and awesome they were. Praying these long praying prayers. Praying long, yeah, long prayers with eloquent language because they were really just wanting to glorify themselves. And Jesus, I love his style because he tells people right to their face exactly how it is, right? Just told them exactly how it was. And he was, so, he was more upset with the Pharisees, the religious leaders who were boasting and bragging about how awesome they were. He was more upset about that than the person that was really trying to live for God. And I want to tell a short story. There's a passage of scripture where it talks about this guy and he is, I mean, he is at the altar and he has, he has brought his gift to the Lord and he is begging and pleading God to forgive him of his sins, right? And you got this Pharisee over here and he's saying, dear, praying this prayer out loud, dear Lord, thank you that I am not like this wretched sinner who is here, who has sinned so much in his life and has so much that he's done against you. Thank you, God, that I am much holier than he is. I mean, that's the kind of attitudes that Jesus was dealing with, and that's what made him so angry. And it just so happens that we were on the temple steps, and this, is, this would have been where Jesus was speaking to these religious officials while they were doing what they do. And he was saying, you know what you guys are like? Let me just give you a little illustration. You're, you're like those tombs because you're dead on the inside and stinky and nasty, but you wear these nice robes and these nice clean clothes and you make yourself look so awesome and you are nothing. You're nothing. So that's where we get this phrase hypocrite. That's right. The actual meaning of the word came from the theater in that day and time. <clears throat> excuse me. They did not have cell phones. They didn't have iPads. They didn't have iPods. They didn't have TVs. Can you imagine? living in that day and time. They didn't have all that. All the kids on the front were like, <laughs> they're like eyes big. Wow. No, I can't imagine that. That's they horrible. They don't have an iPad that you can play with when you're bored? No, they didn't have all that. And so when they wanted to be entertained, they would go to the theater. It's probably a word all of our young people need to like have a lesson on. A theater. We should take them sometime. <clears throat> but they would go to the theater and at the theater they would see a hypocrite. Now in our language we're like, what? Well, because a hypocrite was truly the word that was for an actor. It was a person who put on a different mask, if you will, and played a part. So the word that we use in today's language for hypocrite in the Greek was truly hypokrino. And it meant to judge under. Hypo means under. Krino meant judge, under judge. And it was literally talking about the actors who would go under the mask or under a costume. Like we'll see a lot of people this weekend. They're going to dress up like something they're not. I've heard someone's going to come dressed as me. And someone's going to come dressed as Brad. <laughs> and they're going to try to act like us. You try to see if you can find them on Wednesday night and see who they are. But this is the, the phrase we hear all the time. So when we hear it, we want you to understand what a hypocrite was then was an actor. They were pretending. Man, so we're looking at a person who's basically a fake. They're, they're pretending to be something that they're not. So, so that's why people get really upset with the idea of people attending church. And, and they perceive that these individuals, right, are pretending or acting to be something that they are not. And in some cases, I guess that might be the case, but I don't know why you would waste your time going to church and trying to live for God if it was just a just a show. Why, why would you do that? That doesn't make any sense to me as to why somebody would waste their time if they weren't really trying. Does that make sense? So, so this morning, I want to bring your attention to, uh, to a few points. The first thing is we can't be critical. Look at this point right here. Don't be a religious jerk. Look at somebody and say, don't be a religious jerk. Don't be a religious jerk. Purification is a process. Okay, so, so what I want to talk about right now is God calls us to love people. It's really simple. And if we've drilled anything into our team and our leaders and our volunteers at this church, it is just love people. It doesn't have to be any more difficult than that. Just love people, no matter what, right? So I want to tell you a story. So um, there's been numerous families that have come through this church. There's been numerous instances where we have just caught little glimpses of people kind of being critical. And it doesn't happen very often because we really don't 
promote uh, an environment where that can grow. Does that make sense? Because we are all about life change. But one particular morning, we had one individual that um, she, she met me at the door and she said, Pastor, I'm very disturbed about something. And I said, you are? What, what is it? What is it? And she said, well, do you see so-and-so over there? I said, yeah. Do you see the top that she's wearing? Yeah. Do you not think that's a little inappropriate? Um, uh, what do you want me to do? She said, somebody needs to have a talk with her and tell her she cannot dress like that in God's house. I said, do you want her to dress like that outside of God's house? Or in, what's the difference? What you want me to, okay, so just let me get this straight. You want me to go to her and tell her she needs to dress different. Is that right? Somebody needs to talk to her. And I said, okay, look. If I tell her that, she'll never come back. And we got her here. And she's growing. She's changing. She just hasn't got to the clothes part yet. But it's okay because she's growing and she's going to get better. And I don't really care. <laughs> you know, I, I mean, it's fine. We're here to just love people. And I was trying to be nice about it, but at the same time, man, it hacked me off. It made me so mad because I'm like, what is your problem? I'm like, seriously, you need to find another church because this is maybe not a good fit for you. I didn't say it. Okay, I did not say it. But I was definitely thinking it, and she may have got that point without me having to say it. But I'm like, man, you cannot be critical. That is not what we're doing. That is not why we're here. We catch them. We let God clean them, right? We just love people. Let me give you a really good example. Saying you wouldn't go to church because of the hypocrites is saying I wouldn't go to the gym because of all the people who are out of shape. Now, I want you to think about it. Do you get yourself all perfect and fit? Like, do you work out and get buff at home, and then you go walking into the gym in your nice new attire? Or do you go to the gym yes. because you are out of shape? Who said yes? I'm not telling you. <laughs> Some people, including myself, you probably, we would, because it's like, I'm not going go to the gym. Go home and work out. Get all your veins popping out and walk and be like, what's up? What's up? But you know what? It's crazy because why do you go to the gym? You go to the gym to get in shape, get in shape. to get healthy, to go there and take care of yourself. And so when you go, do you think people at the gym are like looking at them and going like, oh, that wow. That is funny. Wow. They're not a bodybuilder, are they? Oh, they are Wait. a little overweight. <laughs> oh, no, they don't do that. They're like, good job, man. Yeah. Way to come in yes. here and work your tail off and get healthy. Do you ever see somebody running down the road and they're dying? Like, you know they're not a real runner, they're, but they're trying. Do you know we've literally seen people and we stopped the car and said, like, high five. Good like, job. We are proud you. of you. Not that we're anything, no. but that, like, they are trying so hard. Do you know how much, seriously, how much outward strength and confidence does it take? How much strength does it take? When you blatantly look in the mirror and you know that you are not trim and at your ideal weight, Okay, I'm just going to say, it. you're just, you're out there, you're overweight, okay? But you're out there running on the road in front of everybody. In front of everybody. And I'm like, you are awesome. Right. Good for you, man. You are just, you are, I would much rather see that, right, right. than anything else. I would rather see somebody who is trying. I, I love that illustration. That is so good. Because I'm thinking, it is good. How, many like times, it. how many times, how many times, let's just get real. How many times you talk to somebody and say, hey, you know, do you work out? You want to come to my gym? Nah, gym's not for me, you know? Let me think about it. I mean, really. Man, I, I, I know how people are. And, and it makes me so irritated. I know how they are. They go, they go to the store, and they buy this nice new workout outfit. And, and, then, and then they go, and they, and they go to the gym. They might even break a sweat on the treadmill. They're faking it. They're not even doing it for real. They're really just watching TV. And I see them on Saturday night eating at the Chinese buffet. I know what they do. They're stuffing their face. And they have no self-control. And they go to the gym. And they pretend like there's something special. Like they actually work out. Like they're an athlete or something. That is ridiculous. They're a fake. They're a hypocrite. And I'm not going. I am not going to subject myself to that kind of false junk. I'm not going to be around people who aren't the real deal. I'm not going to go to the gym. And I'm definitely That's not going to work good. out. That is good. How ridiculous right? is that? That. That's stupid. It's ridiculous. <laughs> That's stupid. It is just stupid. We don't use that word. No, but we if don't. We did, but I just did. It is. I just did. Stupid. Oh, All right. Stupid. Turn in your word to Romans. 
chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. This is point one. Don't be a religious jerk. Purification is a process. Romans 2, verse 3, and it says this. Since you judge others for doing these things, why do you think you can avoid God's judgment when you do the very same things? Ouch. Don't you see how wonderfully kind, tolerant, and patient God is with you? Does this mean nothing to you? Can't you see that his kindness is intended to turn you from your sins? What this is saying, this was Paul, and he was talking to one of the churches. He was saying, listen to me. Listen, stop being critical. Stop it, okay? Stop being critical because the same God that is going to judge them the way you are is going to judge you according to the same measure. And you know, the only true measure that we are all going to be judged on is this right here, the Word of God. God's Word in black and white makes it plain the way that our life should line up. But what, what Paul was telling them is, listen, God is a kind and gracious and tolerant God. He knows that you may go to the gym and you may run on the treadmill for an hour, and then that night at midnight you break and have a Twinkie, right? Does he say, hey, bam, it you can't come back to the gym? It happens. No, he says, come on. <laughs> Kathy raises her hand. <laughs> 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 we all have had those moments, right? You break down and have a Twinkie. You do, and you don't want anybody to see, and then you feel so bad, and Cla you say, tomorrow. Hey, closet eaters. Tomorrow. The closet eaters. The closet eaters. Right? <laughs> you know why? God is saying that I am. It's time to come out. Yeah, whatever. Of the closet eaters. All right, I had closet. a bite of cheesecake last night at 11. Yes. One bite. One bite at my house. You're a fake. And he said, you're you're a hypocrite. You, you're a hypocrite. You're a closet eater, Misty. I'm like, one you bite? You work out. You sweat. <laughs> you do your thing. You tell people you're all healthy, and then you eat cheesecake in the dark when everyone's asleep. <laughs> My kids were right there. They saw me That's take right. a bite. That's right. That's right. But God is a gracious. Like, honey, shh, shh. We have a mouse. Honey. Honey. She's not in bed. Honey. Honey. <laughs> yeah. What? <laughs> Honey, what are you doing over there in the corner in the dark? Oh, shit. Oh, that is not true. The cheesecake. That oh, is not it's true. so good. At all. And then, are you drinking coffee? Oh, it's so good. <laughs> closet eater. Right there. I've Sorry. never eaten in my closet. You're a hypocrite. I had a bite in the kitchen. You're a hypocrite. But listen, we do that, don't we? We look down our noses at other people because maybe they're still dealing with something that we have overcame. Maybe they're still dealing with an addiction that we have already overcome. You know, God is a gracious and tolerant God, and He is that way because He does. He wants us to repent, and He wants us to turn away from our sin. But God also understands that it's a process. Purification is a process. It doesn't just happen overnight. It just doesn't happen in just a split moment when you say, Jesus, come into my heart, forgive me of my sins. Then you have to get up and guess what? The real work begins. You know, make it up in your mind that you're going on a diet. I, I know so many people and I, I, it, cr it cracks me up, really. I mean, I, I've been around people and they're like, tomorrow I'm starting a diet while they're eating Mon something really bad for them, right? And, and, and it'll it's be generally Monday. Monday. It's usually Monday. Yeah. Okay. But I'm going to start a diet, right? And the next morning, man, they hit it hard for breakfast. And they've got something healthy for breakfast. And by about 2 o'clock in the afternoon, they're breaking. And not only are they breaking, but they're like, hey, I already broke. And their buddy at work with them, they're like, just eat it. Let's just, let's just have a burger. Got and the rest of the day. Now, I man, saw it just this it. week. And I was totally <laughs> laughing because they're like, come on, we already blew it today. Let's start over tomorrow. Come on. Let's just start over tomorrow. But the thing is, it's a process. It's making up your mind and saying, I'm going to get better and better and better. If you ever quit going to the gym, guess what you'll do? You'll completely give up. Yeah. If you ever stop coming to church, you'll completely give up trying to live for God. Because when you come into the house of God, you get around godly people. You get around people who are like, man, I've already been there. Keep going. It's like the gym. At the gym, people are encouraging you. Guess why you like a workout, buddy? Because when you're dying and you can't do one more rep, they're like, come on. Come on. You can do it. Maybe you guys haven't been to the gym. You guys all look kind of like you've never been there. <laughs> man, she's really intense. The, you've got somebody going, come on. You can do it. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. One more rep. And you're like, oh. That's it. I can't do any more. When you come into the house of God, people are saying, come on, you can do That's it. Good. Get back up. That's so what good. if you fail? Get back up. 
that. That's good. Rather than looking down your nose and being a critical religious jerk, let's realize that people, it's a process. It doesn't give us a license to sin, but it does say it is a process to get purified. It is a process to become a righteous person, to become a person who's in that right position with God, who's living right. Jesus said, I have come for those not who are well, but I've come for those who are sick. The church is a hospital for hurting people. So we're here because we might drag ourselves in all beat up and all bruised and and bleeding in the spirit and in life. Life has just beat us up, but this is the place where you need to go for life defense class. God's word teaches you how to live. God's people come around you and love you and encourage you. Jesus was talking to his disciples and they said, hey, how are we going to know? How's the world going to know that we're the real deal? And he said, they're going to know you by the love that you guys have one for another. Right. Right? The Bible says you cannot say that you hate people or hate anybody and say you love God in the same breath because guess what? You're a liar, the Bible says, because God loves all people. And if he's inside of you, then that means you are going to love all people. So when we come across people who are really critical, we think to ourselves, is God really in you? Seriously, Jesus died for every single person that has ever, is now living, and will ever live on this planet. No matter what they've done, Jesus died for them. It's about loving people. We cannot be critical of others. We cannot live that way. We can't live by that paradigm and and look through that lens, through that perspective. We have got to continually love people and be forgiving, forgiving, forgiving. Because when I think about the things that I've done, you're right, it's a process. It's a continual process. I'm nowhere near the way I used to be, but boy, is God still working on me. The Bible says that my righteousness is as filthy rags to God. That means you can do your very, 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 very best to live for God and to be holy and to be set apart. And you will never come close to being as holy as Jesus is. Does that mean you give up? Does that mean you don't give your best? Absolutely not. Give God your very, 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 very best. But just know that it's never going to be good enough. That's why God measures the heart, right? He measures the heart. He doesn't look at us like the Sadducees and the Pharisees wearing these nice clothes and praying these long, eloquent prayers and and giving big tithes and telling everybody about it and fasting openly and publicly. No, God measures our heart. He knows your heart and he wants you to stop the criticism. I know we don't have any critics in this place. I know we don't. I know we don't because because we will weed you out. <laughs> we, you, you, will be, you will be brought out as a spectacle. And no. We are here to cheer one another. We're going to love you too. We're going to love you too. We are here to cheer one another on. Yes. Like people in the gym encouraging one another. All right. Our second point and the final today is this. You have to decide who you want to be and just do it. How many of you guys have Nikes? You have Nike shirt. You got Nike yeah. shoes. I love the slogan, just do it. It's just that determination that says, just make up your mind what you're going to do and just do it. Go to Revelation, the last book in the Bible, chapter 3, verses 16 through 20, and it says this. But since you are like lukewarm water, how many of you guys love just warm water? It's just kind of set out and it's just kind of, ugh. Yeah. Brady raised her and she's yeah. like, I just yeah. want to participate just, just room in temperature? everything. <laughs> no. You like it either really cold. Now, some people, you like ice cold water, right? Right here. Right here. Okay. Or you like it hot. Now, that's me. I get up every day. Wait, wait, wait. This is demented because she drinks scalding hot water. Not hot coffee. Not even hot tea. Hot water. Has no taste, guys. There's a reason. It's clear and has no taste. There's a reason. Do you want to know the reason? Uh, Yeah. Okay. The reason is because you need to have... 8 to 12 glasses of water every single day. Not coffee, not tea, water. But I want to kind of like trick myself into thinking that I'm having coffee or hot tea because I can't have all that all day long. So when I want something hot, I just have me some hot okay. water. All the faces are like, you've lost your mind. Yeah. But I do that. But you either like hot water or you like cold. And, in my and defense, apparently my we mom have two people too. in this congregation that like lukewarm. Okay, <laughs> yes. But let me go back. It says this. But since you are like lukewarm water, you're neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Says God. You say, I am rich. I have everything I want. I don't need anything. And you don't realize that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. 
So I advise you to buy gold from me, gold that has been purified by fire, then you will be rich. Also buy white garments from me, so you will not be shamed by your nakedness, and ointment for your eyes, so you will be able to see. I correct and discipline everyone I love, so be diligent and turn from your indifference. This was God speaking to John. John had been out on, the, on an island and God was speaking to him the entire book of Revelation, which is a prophecy book. But when he was doing this, he was talking to one of the churches and he says, listen to me. You're like lukewarm water. You're, you're just riding the fence. You're not hot. You're not fired up. And you're not cold. You're just in the middle. You're just riding the fence. And I want to throw up. Literally, when you read this, in other versions, it says, spew you out of my mouth or throw up. That our lukewarmness, if we are people who have not made up our mind, we're like, I don't know if I want to be a Christian or if I want to be over here in the world. I'm not really sure. I'm going to kind of ride the fence. One day I'll be here. One day I'll be over here. God says, make up <laughs> <That was funny. laughs> your mind, right? Wake up, okay? Make up your mind. And we want to tell you today, listen, this church, every church is here to help people in that process. But before the process can begin, you have to make up your mind. If you're going to get healthy, you have to first make up your mind. Because I hear a lot of people, they talk about getting healthy. I really should do that. I really should take care of myself. I really should go to the gym. I really should have a salad instead of this cheeseburger. I really, I really, I really. But you know what the difference is? Between the people in the gym trying hard and the people who are just saying, I really, the people in the gym have made up their mind. No matter how hard it is, and believe you me, it's hard. No matter how many times they fall down and they have that Twinkie at midnight, they get back up and they go into the gym the next day and guess what? They get better and they start feeling better and they, it's this process. They keep getting better and better and better. And I want to encourage you today, the Bible says, God wants us to be on fire, red hot. I want to read one more small passage to you as we're closing this morning. In James chapter 3, it talks about fire and it says this in verse 5. In the same way, the tongue is a small thing that makes grand speeches. But a tiny spark can set a great forest on fire. And among all the parts of the body, the tongue is a flame of fire. It is a whole world of wickedness, corrupting your entire body. It can set your whole life on fire, for it is set on fire by hell itself. People can tame all kinds of animals, birds and reptiles and fish, but no one can tame the tongue. It's a restless and evil full of deadly poison. Sometimes it praises our Lord and Father, and sometimes it curses those who have been made in the image of God. And so blessings and cursings come pouring out of the same mouth. Surely, my brothers and sisters, this is not right. Does a spring of water bubble up both fresh water and bitter water? Does a fig tree produce olives and a grapevine produce figs? No. And you can't draw fresh water from salty springs. What he was saying is, listen, God has given us one mouth. God created us to have a mouth that praises and gives honor and glory to God. He was saying, listen, make up your mind. Don't be the kind of person who comes in and glorifies God in the house of God and then goes out and cusses out someone else that's made in the very image of God. Do you realize that when you get angry with other people, you, you got to tell them what you really think. That's somebody that God crafted. He has a plan and a purpose for their life. Who are we? Even though they may not even be in the process yet. Maybe they haven't even come to the understanding that God loves them. Maybe God wants to allow you to show his love to that person with your own mouth. So remember today, don't be a religious jerk. And the second thing is decide who you want to be. Don't ride the fence. Don't, don't be the reason why there are people out there that say, I don't want to go to church because it's full of a bunch of hypocrites, right? Love people. Don't be critical and don't ride the fence. This church is the perfect church for imperfect people, but don't let that be a license to keep on living a life of sin, right? Get burning hot for God. Go all out for God. 
You can do it. Give God your very, very, very best and watch what he does. Will you stand up with me today? I hope this message has blessed you. I hope it's encouraged you. I hope it's birthed within you a heart for those who don't know him. We're about winning the lost, whatever the cost. We're about loving people. And we've got this, man, Wednesday nights, I'm telling you guys, God wants to do something tremendous. He wants to fill up these life rooms. We want to see life change happen. We're believing by faith that God is going to make this happen. And you have an opportunity. Don't be critical of people. Be forgiving as God has forgiven you. Go out this week. I'm going to pray with you, but I want you to go out this week, and I want you to just love people and invite them to church, right? Get them here. Just get them in God's house. And when they see how we're going to love them, their life is never going to be the same again. All right? Would you bow with me today? Father, I, I, I pray right now, Lord, we agree together as a family this morning that if there is any critical bone in our bodies, that you would purge that from us. I pray that you would bring it to our attention today, God, today. Holy Spirit, do what you do best. Convict our hearts and expose to us the imperfections of our spirit and our life. Show us, God, the error of our ways. Show us where we can improve. Show us, Lord, where we can become more like you. Don't let us be critical of other people and the way they live, God, the things they say and the things they think and the things they do, God. We're not their judge. You are. You're their judge, God. But I pray, Lord, that instead you would help us to see those people whose lives don't line up with the fruit of the Spirit. And give us the words to say that we might love them, that we might encourage them, that we also might help them to understand that they're not on the right path and be able to say it in love without them feeling like they're being condemned. Don't let us condemn people, God. It's your job to judge. It's the Holy Spirit's job to convict. It's our job to love. Help us to love. And for those of us in this place this morning or watching online, God, that might be riding the fence. They can't make up their mind who they want to serve, the flesh or the spirit. But I pray, Father God, that you would birth within each and every one of those individuals this morning the inspiration that comes from your spirit, that voice that speaks to them right now and says, you can do this. You can walk in the Spirit. You can reject the flesh. You can overcome the battle within. Because the God that is inside of you is bigger than the battle before you. You can do it. I pray, Father God, that you would place within these individuals a warrior spirit to overcome everything that the enemy has tried to bring their way as he's tried to bring them down in their lives, God. Satan's destiny for their lives, Lord, is that they would be destroyed. That they would die in their sins. But God, your will and your dream, your destiny for those God, is that no one would perish, but all would receive everlasting life. And not just an ordinary life, but an extraordinary life that only comes from the Lord Jesus Christ welling inside of our bodies and our spirit and our mind and making our home and our salvation secure in heaven and in the name of Jesus and who he is and what he's done. God, I pray that you would do this right now in those who are riding the fence in their lives this morning. Pull them over the edge, Father God, by the unction and the power of your Holy Spirit. Do it now. Do it now, Lord. With all heads bowed and eyes closed, I want to give an invitation for those of you that would say, Pastor Brad, I want to know Jesus as my Savior this morning. If that's you, I'm going to count to three. Because you need Him. You can't do life 
without him. You might say, Pastor Brad, I knew Jesus at one time, but I've slipped away. I've fallen away. I don't have that real and life-changing relationship with him that is contagious, and I want to make that happen today, right now. And if that's you, I'm going to count to three. When I do, I want you to raise your hand. If you're watching online, I want you to raise your hand. And then I'm going to pray with you a prayer that basically says, God, forgive me of my sins. I believe that you are who we say you are, who the Bible says you are. And I'm going to confess you as Lord and dedicate my life to you. So are you ready? We're going to count. And this is the most important thing we do. This is why we do what we do at Mountain Movers Church is to win the lost, whatever the cost. Here we go. One, two, three. Amen. Amen. Thank you for your honesty. Thank you so much for your honesty. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. You can put your hands down. I'm going to pray with you right now. I want you to agree with me. And we're going to pray as a family this morning together in unity in support of those who have made this decision to receive Christ as Savior or to renew their lives in Him. Are you ready? Father, I love you. Thank you for Jesus. I know that I've messed up. I pray that you would forgive me. Please forgive me, God. Clean my heart and make me new. I believe right now that Jesus is who he says he is. I confess with my mouth that he is Lord. He's Lord of my life now. I dedicate from this moment forward that I will live for you, God, according to your word. Surround me with the right people. Make your house my home. Help me to develop new habits that would lift you up. I love you. I thank you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Give a hand for those who accepted Christ today. Praise God. Awesome. Hey, thanks so much for joining us today. If you want to be a part of something bigger than yourself, give to our ministry. We've made giving easy here at Mountain Movers Church. If you have your smartphone, just text the number 918-223-8090. Just push in the amount you want to give and push send. It's that easy. If you don't have your smartphone, not a problem. You can mail your giving just as easy to 24,000 South 660 Road, Grove, Oklahoma, 74344. Thanks for watching today. Hey, remember, we're dreaming big for you. We'll see you next week.